Omai. Good morning. This is Judith Lay welcoming you to Manx Radio and to the podcast of this week's edition of At Your Service. Manx Radio. A local organisation gets a new image, a local man writes a new book, and Richard Littledale wants to know what happened next. So let's begin another packed programme with some music. This is the Choir of King's College, Cambridge, with Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, with a soaring descant on the last verse. Scripture Union Ministries Trust has been active on the island for many years, helping young people to explore faith for themselves. But early this month, it launched a new image and a new status, as well as a brand new chief executive. She is Christina Reeves, who joins me now to talk us through this transformation, but firstly to tell us about her own role. I've taken on the role of Chief Executive at SUMT, which is Scripture Union Ministries Trust or Scripture Union on the Isle of Man. And it's a real pleasure. I grew up on the island and I experienced all the great fun activities that Scripture Union organises on the island for children and young people. And then working in schools on the island as a teacher, I was able to support the work in that way. So, yeah, it's just an absolute honour and privilege to be in a position to now help grow the future of the organisation. Historically, Scripture Union on the Isle of Man has been what's called a local mission partner of Scripture Union England and Wales. And we still have a very strong relationship with England and Wales, but we are now a member of Scripture Union International. So that means that we're recognised as a national movement in our own right. And that's come about because we've had nearly 40 years of really effective and sustainable work on the island. But also, I think it's the amount of work that we're able to accomplish across all of the schools to some degree on the island in different ways it's not always the same in every school and obviously we tailor make our engagement depending on what schools want but we do cover 
a lot of the schools on the island in the work that we're doing. And I think it was that in terms of our, the breadth of our engagement with children and young people across different contexts, not just in education, but in the community in churches that they were really impressed with. And we've got the opportunity now to learn and grow and develop in partnership with other scripture union movements who work in similar contexts to us. But also we've got a wealth of experience of working in schools and working with children and young people that we can help resource and train and provide for other movements across the world. So yeah, we're looking forward to that partnership. We probably, as an organisation, were taken aback when we first had a visit from Scripture Union International at their response to what we were doing. They were quite in awe of the work that we've established. And I think that's the unique thing about the Isle of Man. We're such a close-knit community and there are such great opportunities to work really effectively and strategically uh, across the whole community in quite an easy way because of the size of it. And that has a real impact. And I think other Scripture Union movements are, are quite in awe of that opportunity that we have. And I know that in the schools that we work with the t- staff and the head teachers that we work with they really appreciate what we're able to offer and so if there's opportunity for similar programs to be offered in schools around the world then that would be great. Do you think that the fact that you are a teacher yourself you've worked as a teacher on the island do you think that helps in your relationship with the schools that they know that you come with genuine local knowledge? Yeah I think so I mean it's our team we've got a team leader Sue Yardy if she would have the biggest contact with the schools themselves and the team themselves that go in and deliver in schools I think because I have an education background and I've experienced working with Scripture Union as a teacher then it does inform the kind of strategic decisions that I make and how we think about shaping the work that we do where I have an understanding of what are the priorities for the education community and how can we support the holistic development of our children and young people on the island. How would you like people to be looking at Scripture Union now from today? We see ourselves as being a catalyst. So to have the opportunity to um, connect with churches, community groups, um, schools, education communities, and because we kind of can move between those, then we've got that opportunity to create joined up thinking and make links that would be profitable to all parties. We would love to continue to be that kind of instigator of those wonderful connections and relationships that will bring sustainable long-term impact and benefit to our children and young people. Would you like to see the churches on the island getting more involved and understanding better what you do? Yes, absolutely. I think across all denominations, we want to have strong communication links with the churches because I feel that what SUMT is able to offer and the work that we're able to do is really effective, powerful mission work to the next generation. And I know that with uh, island communities such as ours and rural communities, it feels as though young people aren't engaging with church community. SU England and Wales did some research and they say that 95% of young people who are 18 and under have no contact with a church community whatsoever, no link. And so because we have opportunities to engage with young people outside the context of church, then it offers us that ability to where children are interested and want to know more we can give them understanding of faith and what it means to follow Jesus Christ and our hope is that the churches will want to partner with us in that work whether it is that they want to give time and volunteer for us whether they want to pray for us or they may wish to support us the work that we're doing financially because we are a faith-based organization and all of our funding is charitable donations so yeah the, the crucial thing here is something that you've just said, that it's giving the children the knowledge so that they can then decide what they want to do. But to not have the knowledge is, is depriving them, isn't yes. it, really? Yes, absolutely. We believe that where faith is understood and respected in a community, then everyone benefits. And for children and young people not to have the opportunity to hear different perspectives 
and have the opportunity to explore those that they're interested in is, like you say, depriving them. And so we want to ensure that there is a representation of the Christian perspective that children and young people can engage with at whatever level that they're interested in. So we always encourage children to come to their own conclusions in what they hear. And a lot of the work that we do in schools is just encouraging questioning and thinking and wondering and curiosity to begin that journey of exploring what is out there, how different people think and and what they may themselves want to value and go forward with personally. One of our focuses moving forward is definitely going to be on in training and particularly training young leaders and then supporting them in how they then engage in mission and working you know, either with children or young people or working in organisations like SUMT that support that mission work. Leadership skills are skills for life, you know, in any context. And so, yes, giving the opportunity for young people to gain those skills maybe outside of an educational context, in a slightly more informal context, is obviously going to be of benefit. Yeah. Christina, just in conclusion, your new logo. Now, I want to try out to see whether I'm looking at this rightly or wrongly, (laughs) because to me, it looks like a thumbprint, like a coloured thumbprint. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been told that everybody's thumbprint is unique. Now, that says to me that you're concerned with uniqueness, with people's specialness. You are spot on. Yes, absolutely. It represents that celebration of the uniqueness of each individual. And we believe that God has created and loves and appreciates every individual and knows who they are. And uh, we want to celebrate that We also use the thumbprint because it involves touch and it's tactile. And what we hope to offer is a very multi-sensory learning experience when we deliver in educational contexts or outside of that. And to ensure that what we offer is accessible to all, no matter what the learning needs of any child might be. The coloured lines also, the reason for the different colours, the thinking behind that was that we want to ensure that there are multiple pathways in which children can reach faith if they wish to. And so by having a variety of different curriculum days, lessons, activities, clubs that we run, then it gives children different pathways that they might want to engage. Christina Reeves, I wish you every possible success with Scripture Union on the island as a separate entity, as part of Scripture Union International. This won't affect the Beach Mission, will it? Oh, no, not at all. Port St. Mary Beach Mission is going to continue and grow from strength to strength, I'm sure. We now will oversee the Beach Mission as a, our own SU movement, and we're really looking forward to developing that partnership and strengthening the work that they do, because the fact that it's been operating on the island for over 120 years is just incredible and I know I'm one of the children you know I was a child that went to beach mission so I know for many people it holds a really special place in their heart so by no means will that cease Christina Reeves, the new Chief Executive of Scripture Union on the Isle of Man. And if you'd like to know more about their work, there's a website. It's the first letter of each word of their name, Scripture Union Ministries Trust, S-U-M-T dot I-M. Anglican
Anglican priest, the very Reverend John Mann, was a guest on this programme some months ago, shortly after he and his wife Helen returned to live in Laxey, where Helen was born, a move made possible by John's retirement. Now he's back to talk about a new book that'll be officially launched in a couple of weeks' time. John was born in London, moved with his family to the Isle of Man in 1973, studied at Queen's University in Belfast, and was ordained in the Church of Ireland. His ministry has included eight years as Dean of Belfast Cathedral. John has always been passionate about the benefits of working closely with churches of other denominations, and in recognition of this, he was awarded the Lambeth Cross for Ecumenism by the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2018. John is now writing devotional books, and whilst he writes as an Anglican, he intends his books to be useful to people of all denominations. The first one is called Journeying to the Light, a collection of daily readings for each of the days of Advent and Christmas, a time that we traditionally think of as a time of preparation. Well, you know, what are we preparing for? We're preparing, obviously, there's celebrations, there are going to be family things, there are going to be work things, there are going to be community things, there are carol service and all this sort of thing. There's a lot of just work that, that goes into those days before Christmas. From the Christian church perspective, yes, it is preparation, but I think it is also uh, looking to come out of darkness into light because we're thinking of the light of the world coming in Christ being born at Christmas. So in terms of thinking through, you know, what is the darkness of the world today? What is the darkness of my life today? And looking to the light of Christ. So we look to the, the, the prophets, we look to the New Testament as well, and we, we understand that we're not alone in this quest and we're being led down that way uh, by Christ himself. So I suppose that, that there's a lot in that and whether we're thinking in terms of the first coming of Christ as a baby in Bethlehem or whether indeed for the second coming there is still that thought of being led by God through, through darkness into light. Do you think there is sometimes a, a natural almost resistance where you, you think the prophets, the Old Testament, I'm going to get lost. I, I, I don't know whether I'll be able to understand this. Do you think People think that. Well, and that may be the case. I mean, if if you know where the texts are, of course, it makes it far easier. You know. um, but I mean, people will go and they'll listen to Handel's Messiah and, you know, these wonderful texts are being sung. And actually, when you find them in the Bible, uh, you say, oh, well, that's familiar. Yes, I heard that, you know. And uh, um, so th there is a lot there. There are ways of accessing these things, but, but certainly to have something that sort of guides, then I think that helps as well. So how have you structured your book? Tell us about that, John. I've gone to the the readings, the appointed readings for each day in Advent and indeed through Christmas as well. And some of these are from the prophets, some of them are from the Gospels. And so the book is structured. There's a little reading for each day. Um, and uh, then there's I'm maybe taking one verse or a couple of verses and just expounding that a little bit. So it's it's a reading, you know, five or ten minutes a day. And of course, Advent isn't always the same length, so I've had to adapt it to a shorter or longer Advent as well. But um, yes, that works out all right. How accessible would it be to somebody who hasn't got a lot of or perhaps not got any church background, but is just interested in the idea of having a little time to reflect each day? Well, I think that um, books like this, um, I mean, I pick them up and I don't understand everything that's being said in them. You know, some of it probably may just pass you by, but that doesn't matter, does it? You know, if there's, if there are parts of it that you think, oh, yes. Now, that rings a bell with me, or that, mm, I hadn't thought of that before. I, I mean, I don't think that anything that I say is particularly world-chattering or anything like that. You know, all of these things have been said before, but it is putting them in a, in a way that it is sort of leading you through on a path, um, a, a journey, as I'm describing it. Yeah. Now, you haven't written it with any particular denomination in mind, wearing your, very much your ecumenical hat, and it's been well received by, by members of, of different denominations, hasn't it? Well, I, I hope it to be uh, read in that way. The, the readings certainly are, are used, certainly by the Roman Catholic Church, in the Anglican churches, probably the Methodist Church as well. So it's, it isn't specific to any one church. You mentioned using some readings from Isaiah, from one of the prophets, Isaiah, and 
Isaiah's writings in itself are just very beautiful. There's some very beautiful poetry and imagery there, isn't it? So even if you have no idea who Isaiah is, it's worth dipping into, isn't it? Oh, they're, they're wonderful. I mean, particularly the latter chapters of, of Isaiah, the, there's some just beautiful, beautiful writing. And it's always a joy to, to go back and, and read those texts. But really the basic message is, is a message for us any time in the year, this moving towards the light. It is. And one has only got to reflect on the world as, as things are. And, you know, you sit and you, you read through the news and you realise that that's what is the news today, but the difficulties of yesterday or last week or last month are still out there in the world and people are are crying out for help and support and I, I think if if it can help us to reflect not only on our own situation but on that of others as well, it's leading you not only to reflect on your own situation and that of others but leading you from reflection actually into prayer itself. And that is part of the Advent journey as well, in the sense to sort of deepen one's thought and also prayerfulness around the coming of Christ. And, you know, we've talked about the prophets, but how about John the Baptist? How about Mary? These are two figures that we think about a lot in Advent. You think of the prayerfulness of Mary and her response to her call, and indeed in a very different way, but no less important, the, the call of John the Baptist. Again, a person of, of tremendous prayer and, and deep spirituality. If these people aren't also encouraging us in our life of prayer and our struggle through that, then, well, they are. I was brought up with a prayer book that you hold in your hand and you read. And I suppose still that's my most comfortable way of reading and praying. But, you know, the, the screens, the online services, the streaming of services, all these kinds of things, they're all working and they all are suiting some people. And it allows people as well, I think, to, to see the kind of variety of ways the church is using to tell people about the light of the world coming into the world. Thank you to the very Reverend John Mann and his book, Journeying to the Light, is out now and will be officially launched here on the island at a special event in the evening on November the 9th at our retreat house, Tide of A, Ballawattleworth House in Peel. It's free to attend with light refreshments served, but space is limited, so if you'd like to reserve your place, you can do so via the website retreathouse.im or give them a call on 609 299 609 299. And now it's time for us to join Richard Littledale again for the last in his mini-series called What Happened Next? During his short time on earth, Jesus taught the depth of God's loving care for us through the stories he told and the miracles he worked. Jesus' death on the cross might have seemed like failure, but his rising from the dead three days later showed to his closest friends that all he had said was true, that death is never the end for all who follow him. And he left behind his disciples to go on spreading the message and showing that same love. But this didn't always make them popular with the authorities. A slave girl began following the disciples Paul and Silas, begging them to drive an evil spirit out of her. When Paul did so, her masters were furious. The slave girl had been telling fortunes, and her masters were concerned that by driving the spirit out of her, the girl would no longer be able to earn money for them. So they had Paul and Silas put into prison. What happened next is there for us to read in chapter 16 of the Acts of the Apostles. God, all the praise is yours. God, all the praise is yours. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. 
The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised. Glory to God, for you are good. According to the Bible, that's where the story ends. But writer and Baptist minister Richard Littledale wonders what happened when the workmen came to the prison to fix all those broken locks. A job's a job's a job, son, my dad would say. You should only ask two questions ever. What needs doing and who's paying for it? Nothing else. I knew those were the rules, but they had never been harder to obey. Our customer this time was a funny sort, a jailer. Now, any jailer I have ever met has had a face like thunder and a temper like an angry camel. Not this one. He was friendly and obliging and happy to see us there. He kept muttering something about such an unforgettable night under his breath as he showed us from one cell to the next. Why would a jailer be happy, I wondered, when someone had trashed his jail? Not only that, but how had they trashed it? Every door was still firmly on its hinges, but the lock was broken clean in two. There were no saw marks from cutting, nor burrs where a tool might have twisted them. The manacles were the same. Each set was still firmly fixed to the wall, but each cuff was sliced down the middle, like a piece of cheese sliced with a wire. I had never seen anything like it. The prisoners in each cell smiled and nodded at us as we worked our way from cell to cell. To see their faces, you'd have thought they'd had a party the previous night. No one gave anything away, though, and there was one cell, right in the middle, with no occupants. Generally, I never want to go back and visit a job again. After all, if you have to go back, it's because you didn't do it well enough in the first place. All the same, I find myself stopping and staring Every time I go past that jail, whatever went on in there, I wonder. All glory and honor, blessing and power, because your name alone is worthy, worthy forever. The praise is yours. Thank you, Richard Littledale. Imagining what happened next is the subject of a new book that Richard is writing now and is due for publication next year. But right now, it's notice board time and we begin in Abbeyland's Chapel. They invite you to celebrate harvest with them. There are two services this afternoon at three o'clock with Mrs Elaine Christian and this evening at half past six with Reverend Richard Hooten. Then Abbeyland's Chapel complete their harvest celebrations tomorrow, Monday evening, when they'll have a short service followed by the auction of harvest produce, followed by supper. That starts tomorrow at 7 o'clock and all are most welcome. Port Erin Gospel Church, next to the Roman Catholic Church in Port Erin, will be holding a special series of meetings from Monday to Friday this week, 23rd to the 27th of October. Just an hour each lunchtime from half past twelve to half past one. Come in for a short Bible study and a bite to eat. The subject will be Psalm 23, the Shepherd's Psalm. Then next Sunday, the 29th, harvest services will be held in Port Erin Gospel Church in the morning at half past eleven and in the evening at six o'clock. The speaker will be Mr Trevor Wiley from Coleraine in Northern Ireland and everyone will be made most welcome. The annual fair trade sale in the Cool Chapel Hall will be held later this week, from Thursday the 26th to Saturday the 28th of October, each day from 10am to 6.30pm. Christmas cards, lovely craft items and food will be on sale. 
These bring satisfying employment, fair wages and a better way of life to many in the poorest parts of our world. And simple lunches will be served from noon until 2pm each day at a cost of just £7. And proceeds from these lunches will benefit three charities in the developing world. And as always at The Cool, there's a warm welcome for all. The Cool Chapel is on the edge of the Isle of Man Business Park, close to the junction of Cool Road and Vicarage Road. St Jude's Church invites you to their Harvest Festival service this coming Friday evening, the 27th, starting at 7pm with refreshments served afterwards. Looking ahead to next Sunday the 29th and it's Plough Sunday at Selby Methodist Church. Come and meet the farmers and thank them for their work. The service starts at half past ten. The music will be provided by Crosby Silver Band and you're invited to stay on for light refreshments after the service. And next Sunday evening there's a Manx bilingual service in Balabeg Methodist Chapel. Starting at half past six next Sunday, the 29th, it'll be led by Reverend Dr. Janet Corlett and the theme will be Hidden Riches. The soloists will be Ruth Kegan gell and Krista McCartney and there'll be refreshments afterwards. And that's all that we have time for now. But I'll be back later in our virtual lounge tonight at nine with a mix of easy listening music, your requests and your dedications. And I'd love you to join me if you can. So... Till whenever we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for listening and I wish you and those you love a blessed and peaceful week and a very good morning. The